Using the methods of Namikawa's time, a present-day artisan tried to create black cloisonné. The kiln burns at about 1,200 degrees Celsius. It's a melting pot of glass and metal, a fusion that becomes enamel. Before Namikawa, no one had made black enamel. Craftsmen back then didn't even know what materials were needed to produce it. Even now, making black enamel is considered a difficult challenge. Minute fluctuations in temperature and humidity can affect the resulting color. Artisans have only their experience and intuition to rely on. If it comes out well, it produces a beautiful hue and luster. But it's hard. Not many want to do it. Making black enamel is like climbing one mountain after another. Namikawa tried every possible ingredient he could think of to create black enamel. Using trial and error, he mixed countless batches. Finally, he succeeded in producing a jet black enamel. A black background allows a design to stand out sharp and clear. A modern vase, covered with enamel paste, goes into the kiln. Now, the black enamel starts showing its true colors. The modern day artisan removes the piece exactly five minutes later. The black hue has emerged murky and uneven. He says it's because he pulled the vase out a few seconds too soon. Unlike other colors, black enamel doesn't allow for any mistakes. Everything must go perfectly. Some craftsmen are said to even be fearful about working with black, believing that it harbors something evil. Namikawa himself kept fighting the darkest color. He kept making endless samples over and over to create the kind of black enamel he dreamed of. Finally, he succeeded in creating this black cloisonné. was displayed at the exposition in Paris, attracting tremendous interest among people from many countries. In search of Namikawa's black, individuals from around the world came to visit his workshop. Japan's overseas shipments of fine arts and crafts like cloisonné were expanding steadily. They came to account for 10% of the nation's total exports in value. When high quality pieces were, had become available, 
then people suddenly realize, my goodness, Japanese craftsmen can produce the type of things that we can't produce in the West. So in fact, we started to copy um, in, in some ways. Artworks were helping to boost Japan's presence in the world soon after the country had opened its doors. The imperial household was commissioning work to nurture more craftsmen. It gave them increasingly challenging assignments to advance their skills to the highest levels possible. This gleaming gold cabinet is one of their achievements. Chrysanthemum flowers, the imperial symbol, are rendered across its surface in powdered gold. Flying among the golden flowers are small rainbow-colored birds. The decorative technique involved inlaying mother-of-pearl cut from the inside of a seashell. It took 13 years to complete this cabinet. During that time, dozens of artisans were engaged in the production. This helped heighten their skills and allowed various techniques to be passed down from one generation of craftsmen to the next. One of the pieces in the Imperial collection saved a traditional industry that was struggling during the Meiji period. This is that artwork. Six meters wide and three meters tall, it's exceptionally large among the Imperial treasures. The tapestry depicts a fantastic world of birds and flowers of every season in full bloom. It was created by a Kyoto-based artisan named Jinbei Kawashima. This work is not painted with a brush. It's actually woven. The depiction is so elaborate, it looks like a painting. And it's this artistry that is said to have saved Japan's textile industry from a crisis. The factory that made this huge tapestry is still operational in Kyoto. Believe it or not, this is a single loom that's 24 meters wide. It mainly produces curtains for large halls. To create patterns, threads of various colors are woven into vertical strands of white thread. Everything is done manually. It's very hard work, but I feel great when I'm done. There's a wonderful sense of accomplishment. But size isn't the factory's only feature. Its craftsmen have the skills to express subtle shadings of color. It was the company's leader, Jinbei Kawashima II, who came up with the technique. Many people view Kawashima as a legendary hero who saved Japan's textile industry. In the late 19th century, Western culture was beginning to take root in Japan. The government was encouraging women to wear Western-style clothing. 
This dealt a heavy blow to Japan's traditional textile industry. Textiles were Japan's core industry, but rapid westernization was forcing many makers to close shop. Worried about the future, this second generation owner of a textile factory in Kyoto decided to do something. Kawashima looked overseas for a route to survival. He spent 40 days aboard a ship to get to France, a major cultural center. His aim was to learn about the European textile business. What he found there was a completely different way of using textile products than in Japan. Sofas, carpets, and curtains to decorate windows. Textiles were being used as interior furnishings. Kawashima wondered, couldn't we sell Japanese textiles here? After returning to Japan, something else caught his attention. Japanese-style paintings. They commonly depicted birds and flowers, but such designs were mostly absent in Western textiles. <laughs> 